This summer, the University Art Museum, Performing Arts Center, and New York State Writers Institute, the three arts presenters at UAlbany, discuss the idea of a collaboration to address the pandemic, racial reckoning, and cultural uncertainty. How could we plan relevant programming that focuses in substantive ways and with lasting impact? How could we connect with our students and communities? While discussing these questions, we all felt certain that whatever we came up with, it would in some way include artists. Artists that we have worked with and presented at UAlbany, artists we admired, artists we knew were deeply invested in making sense of our world in this fraught moment. We arrived at this series, Artist to Artist, addressing this moment. We have invited nine artists three each from visual, performing, and literary arts disciplines to participate in three pre-recorded conversations over the course of the fall 2020 semester. Our goal is to offer collaborative programming that provides continued opportunities for student and public engagement in an online format. We hope these conversations will help shine a guiding light on difficult issues, share perspectives that could lead to tangible solutions, and demonstrate the need for respect, empathy, inclusivity, and humanity. These things are at the core of creative works of art and are needed more than ever in today's society. My name is Kim Engel, and I am the Associate Director of the UAlbany Performing Arts Center. I'm delighted to introduce our first guest, Ping Chong, an American contemporary theater director, choreographer, video and installation artist. Ping Chong and Company produces works addressing the important cultural and civic issues of our times with the greatest level of artistic innovation and social integrity. Ping's company visited U Albany in October 2018 and presented two performances of Beyond Sacred, Voices of Muslim Identity. My name is Paul Grandal. I'm the director of the New York State Writers Institute. We are delighted to introduce Ibi Zaboy, author of the powerful YA novel in verse, Punching the Air, about a boy who was wrongfully incarcerated and was co-written with prison reform activist Yusuf Salam of the Exonerated Five. She is also the author of Pride, My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich, and the National Book Award finalist, American Street. Ibi previously visited UAlbany in February 2019 to discuss her edited anthology, Black Enough, stories of being young and black in America. My name is Corinna Rip Shamming, and I'm the director and chief curator at the University Art Museum. I am pleased to introduce you to Alex Bradley Cohn, a Chicago-based artist employing the language of modernist painting to explore themes such as play, culture, identity, hip hop, and the intimate relationship between artist and sitter. Alex exhibited at the University Art Museum in 2018 as part of the three-person show, Triple, alongside work by Shabalala Self and Louis Fratino. Good morning, everyone. Um, maybe we could share what we do, um, who we are, which aren't synonymous. Um, I'm Evie Zaboy. I am Haitian American. I am an author for books for young people meaning picture books for five to 18 YA novels. And I've published a speculative fiction for adults, short stories, um, short stories for adults. So I've been writing for almost 20 years since I was in college, but I've been a traditionally published author for a little over three years. And I have five books published so far. Cool. Yeah, and I'm Alex Bradley Cohen. Um, I'm a painter, but I do lots of different things too. I guess I'm a visual artist, but, and I'm based in Chicago. Um, and my work primarily deals with the figure, um, which is like a very open casket. But um, yeah, I'm a figurative painter and it's kind of investigating both like interior, interiority and exteriority simultaneously. Um, in moving between those two spaces of both like the social and the, and the asocial at times. 
Um, I'm Ping Chong, and uh, I'm artistic director of Ping Chong and Company, uh, which is a interdisciplinary, uh, both performing arts, mostly performing arts uh, company. But I also, um, when I uh, have the opportunity, I will accept uh, it, uh, visual arts projects, installation projects, although that's not really the main part of my, my work. Um, we're an organization. Um, that's been going on for 49 years in New York City. And uh, as, as a non-white organization, that's pretty amazing that I've been able to last this long without the usual support from you know who. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, and, and right now we, uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, at a point where I'm starting to look ahead to supporting younger artists um, diverse artists from all over, in other words, all the Americans. Um, so that's what I'm doing now is I'm trying to help rather than about my career, it's about trying to figure out how to help younger artists um, create work and support them. I'd like to add that I'm married to a visual artist. Um, that's my husband's print back there. Okay. <laughs> um, and this living room is filled with art. Um, my husband and daughter's paintings. Oh, wow. Um, and also, uh, you can't see it, but um, our house is like an artist's house. Um, and my re recent book, Punch in the Air, is written with Exonerated Five member Yusef Salam, and it's about a young teen visual artist. Um, and there are illustrations um, here. My daughter's a dancer. Um, my other daughter is an illustrator. So, and I've uh, performed as well. I have friends who are installation artists. Um, one friend just finished her uh, MFA at Columbia doing installation art. So. I love artists. I, I'm, sur I'm surrounded by artists, so I'm happy to be in conversation with both of you. By the way, I just wanted to say I love that color of your wall behind you. And I love that green behind you, too, <laughs> that your jacket there. I know, um, you guys, in a way, we're almost all color coordinated. <laughs> it's like you're green and you're green, you're kind of like more warmer colors, and then I have this gray, gray. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I didn't, yeah, which is funny. Oh, yeah, it, uh, yeah I, I'm just curious, does anybody want to talk about how, how the pandemic's been for them on, under, these, uh, under these difficult circumstances, both the pandemic and the whole unrest in the country? Do you want to go there, anyone? Yeah, that feels like the most, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that could be a good starting point. It could just be where we're coming from at this moment. And yes, yeah, so I, I read the question and I thought about it. And it was so, like, yeah, I guess for every person, it's a little bit different. And I think for me, it, is, it, was, a, it was very timely in the fact that I just graduated um, from my MFA. And I literally graduated the week that we went into lockdown. So in a lot of ways, this time has been really um, restorative for me because I was like, real, I was like graduating and you know, everyone's like, what are you gonna do? And I was like, I gotta find a job. And then it was just like the country shut down. So it was like all those things I didn't have to think about. And it kind of just gave me a time to think about what I had just experienced in grad school without the pressures of having to perform anything. So for me, very specifically, it became, it's been this really amazing time that has been really restorative where I've been able to kind of um, ask the question like it's like ask the questions that I was asking myself inside grad school and I don't have to deal with the pressures of the outside world of like finding a job um and performing and so for me it's been really restorative I'll say that <laughs> selfishly like <laughs> like that's just what it's it, it's been that um yeah it's been restorative for me. I like that word restorative and it forced everyone to pivot um, inward, uh, to go inward. And we are forced to contend with our artist selves. Um, the pandemic happened just as I started promoting my last book. Um, and I was nervous about being out there 
with a, a somewhat of a political figure, Youssef Salam was at 16 accused of raping a white woman in Central Park and he was later exonerated. But most importantly, um, our current president had put out an ad for those five young men to be executed by the state. Um, he was calling for the death penalty back in 1989. And I met Youssef in college in 1999 and I wanted to interview him for our college's newspaper. Um, I never got that interview, but we ended up talking about who he thought at that time was the one person responsible for his false conviction. And that man was Donald Trump. Uh, and I can't believe, and you know, he can't believe that that man is our current president. And I can't help but think about serendipity um, within the larger context of the universe and what that means. Um, it always seemed as if the US was invincible. Um, as an immigrant, you know, you come here for the American dream and you can accomplish anything just as I have, who, you know, I can't go to Haiti and call myself an author and be able to support myself off of writing. In some countries that's not possible, but here it's possible. At the same time, the pandemic let a lot of us know that, you know, these borders, these imaginary borders don't matter when it comes to a infectious disease. <laughs> You know, you would think that, you know, oh, that's something that's happening over there. You know, they don't have a stable government or the economy or the medical system is not as advanced as ours. It's not going to touch us, but here we are. <laughs> so it was one of those things that let me know this idea of America uh, being infallible um, was a myth all along. And what does that mean for me as an artist? You know, I, I feel that I feel that it'll be okay to start critiquing this country um, and be deliberate and intentional about critiquing this country in my work for young children. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, um, the, there's a very old um, Chinese novel that's, um, it's like the Chinese Iliad. And the first line in this epic novel about China when there were three different states fighting each other. The opening lines of that novel is kingdoms wax and wane. And uh, so the United States, like any other place, is very ethnocentric and, and uh, it will not always be on top. You know, it's, we're talking about the long span of time that other cultures understand. It, when they're longer cultures, we're 400 years old. We're barely a teenager, this country, you know? And, it, and, and we have all the problems of a teenager, which is we have too much freedom, too much power and uh, as a nation, and, and uh, we're dangerous to adults is, is the way I see this country right now, too much power. One thing about the pandemic that I think has been interesting for me is that, especially at the beginning of it, and I live in New York City, um, and I've lived in New York City all my life, um, and I've seen it change from uh, my youth when New York was depressed and bankrupt to this conspicuous consumption uh, uh, just before the pandemic shut down with, uh, with uh, people totally uh, narcissistic and consumerist, and that the city had been sort of uh, taken over by corporations completely. And when when uh, Walmart came into the city, I said, "This is the end. This is the beginning of the end for us as a city with a personality. We're just going to be like everything else. You know, we'll just have all the same franchise bullshit that the rest of the country is going to have. We're going to lose our character." And and uh, Growing up in a city where I remember that you, uh, um, uh, a family could have a small business and raise their kids and um, support, support um, a small business and raise their kids and send them to college, that was increasingly disappearing. I know I'm straying a little bit from the pandemic aspect of this, but it, it sort of contextualizes uh, what New York um, was and what New York has become. The pandemic kind of shut 
this consumerist thing down, which made me very happy. You know, and 30% of these, these privileged, entitled people have left the city. And I'm very happy about that. And I just, I just wish we could have a real place like we did once. People always say, oh, old people always talk about how much better it was in the past. Well, it was on one level. On another level, racism was more blatant when I was a kid than it is now. Now it's polite racism, you know. Um, living in New York City, you know, you, the one thing that the pandemic did that was wonderful was it shut the noise out. It suddenly got quiet. And I remember the, that, those fir that first month when it was so quiet, I went, thank God, I am so sick of the noise, you know, and now it's kind of slowly edging back towards noise somewhat, but not quite as, as it was before. But one thing that I think the pandemic also did, which was good, I think, you know, it's hard to think of it as good, but in a way, it just made people think about, made people think, like you, like, like uh, Eb said, you, you start to have, you start to realize again, for writer, for us artists, we always have, have had a very rich internal life. That's what we, that's what we draw from. But for people who don't, who aren't artists, all of a sudden they had to think about their inner lives, which they never had to do before, and now that's something that they might have to confront. And I, and I welcome that for people because in a consumerist society, we're always encouraged not to go in. We're encouraged, we're distracted all the time by TV monitors, by piped in music all over the place so that you don't think that, so that you can be manipulated and um, be just consumers, you know? And I, I think that this shutdown made people have to think about more real things. Um, so I think it's it's been, uh, and as an artist, it's not a problem for me so much because I have a, I've, my internal life has the opportunity to be less distracted, like like Alex said. You know, I have time, um, more time to to uh, work on stuff. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the, yeah, yeah, you just summed up like a good, like a good thing. That was like, yeah. I, you know, I, you brought up um, old New York and I wasn't born in, in New York. I came here when I was four years old and there was something very endearing about 80s, 90s New York. You may remember 70s recently. Um, I told a friend like, wow, it's starting to look and feel like 80s New York again. But my friend who's older than me said, no, it's starting to look and feel like 70s New York. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're kind of just like, which one was worse? Uh, so in that sense, it, it there were parts of it that were not great, was not great. Yes. Um, I just remember the muggings. My mother was mugged. Um, the violence for young people. Um, but then there was a lot of creativity. There was an incredible amount of innovation and creativity happening in New York City. Uh, that's what I miss. Even as a teenager in the 90s, um, we all had our own unique style. It was hyper-local um, style and art. Um, I'm thinking about radio, how radio was just a huge aspect of my upbringing where this is where you discovered new music. And I was talking about a certain style of music that was only um, heard in New York City and other people, my friends who are from other states know nothing about it. And I missed that sort of art um, for my children who are teenagers. Um, there isn't a New York City thing, uh, a New York City look. And now we have, um, you know, syndications, you know, things are just broadcasted everywhere and we, no longer have a way of just defining our local environment and interacting with our local environment in unique ways through art. Everything that I've written so far is a product of my New York City upbringing and being a Black immigrant in New York City. Um, I want to ask you all, um, especially you, Alex, how are you, how do you interact with Chicago? I think we're all coming from 
the inner city. Chicago is notorious for certain things. New York City mm -hmm. is notorious for certain things. Um, mm -hmm. How are we making art that direct that is in direct conversation with our very local environment in the midst of globalization, you know, yeah. and a national dialogue and social media where everybody from everywhere is in conversation and there isn't the very special thing about the neighborhoods and the cities that we come from. Yeah, one thing that it's made me um, really aware of is architecture and the architecture in my neighborhood. Um, Cause I began going on a lot of walks through my neighborhood um, because I wasn't being pulled throughout the city in all these different ways. Like I, I stopped um, taking the bus and the train. So I just began like walking a lot in my neighborhood just to get out. And I became like super aware. I've become very hyper aware of buildings in my neighborhood that mm -hmm. I had never really ever saw before because I was just always so busy and like trees that are, I began documenting like on my phone um, that are now finding their way into a lot of like the empty spaces within my paintings. Um, so I think um, in a lot of ways it's, um, yeah, wow. So the, yeah, so Arctic, so like, just like the built environment around my home, I've become more aware of. But, and I think, um, wow, I just sidetracked because that's actually a real experience that I've been having. I, I've been seeing these buildings that I've never seen before, um, just like walking slowly. Um, so I think living in Chicago, like any, it's just a place. It's brought me back um, to like where I'm at. And um, a lot of my work, also dealt with like community in the sense of like the portraits that I've been painting the last few years but now it's like um that has been kind that was taken away in grad school in a way because I was so engaged with my work in an intellectual level and an academic level because I was in school and I wasn't having these sort of interpersonal relationships out in the world like things just became so mediated by thought rather than feeling um, that I think this time of the pandemic, um, yeah, like it has made me more aware of my body, right? Like my own architecture um, that I think that is my, like having an effect on the way that I'm, I guess I'm structurally thinking about the paintings, um, bringing in more of these outside elements and outside world. But it's funny because it's coming from a, a place of uh, solitude, right? Um, and alienation, um, being more aware of things that are outside of me uh, or that have been outside of me that maybe I've had, I've had to block out. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where I just went with that, um, but yeah. So yeah, not what is, yeah, so I guess the, the pandemic has just, yeah, I mean, I think as I said it, like it's kind of just slowed me down in a way, it's been nice. And so it's like, even like my own intimate relationships with people is I've become more aware of those relationships too through this pandemic. It's like, yeah, I've been sort of isolated and alienated, but then it's like, since I'm not living so far outside of myself, like uh, performing or capitalism or trying to, um, uh, just get things that like the people and things that are around me, I've just become closer to. I, I love what you said about, I love what you said about um, the altered perception of your local uh, area because because that definitely you start, it, it changes your perception because yeah. you're not distracted by, by so much stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed trees. Like, I'm, yeah. like, wow, I'm like, look at this tree. I've never noticed this tree before. Um, <laughs> or like, and it's like, I've walked by this tree a hundred times and it's like, wow, look at it. Like, and so, yeah, and it's weird. The last few weeks, you know, like it's been a process, right? Like the last few weeks I've been like, this has been like the new me where I'm like documenting more things. Cause you know, I, I work from photographs. Um, so photography is a part of it. And so it's just like, I'm, gathering more information than I previously was. So I guess um, for anyone, um, both of you, where does 
I like doing deep dives, <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh, how about um, the economics of being an artist right now? How has well, that- Well, it's pretty tough for the theater. You can imagine, you know, the performing arts, it's, it's tough, you know. Um, in, my, in my case, when, when the pandemic hit in March, we were about to open a show in April. Uh, fortunately, it was a pretty low budget show and uh, uh, and we we could we could um, we could not you know we didn't get that it didn't cost a lot to to get up or anything so we were we we were lucky you know there wasn't an investment of of a lot of money in this thing it was it was pretty low budget but um, at the beginning they were saying oh you know like this isn't going to last that long I knew it was going to last long I knew it I, so. I just went ahead assuming that we're going to have at least a year ahead of us where it wasn't going to be possible to get back in the theater. Uh, and that was even before um, our fearless leader was not wearing a mask and uh, encouraging people not to wear masks, you know. Um, getting back to that pandemic thing again, which is like this kind of American freedom, this teenage, teenager immature idea of of uh, narcissistic self entitlement that you don't need to wear a mask, you don't have to protect anybody else that is, is, uh, is part of our um, lesson to learn is that we've lost uh, for a while now, we've lost a sense of what community means. And this, I don't know if we'll learn our lesson, but I think that that's a really important thing right now is, is that we recognize how important community is. And instead of everybody careening off into their own narcissistic uh, interests, you know. Um, I, I, don't, I don't remember what you, whether you asked the question or not, actually. No, 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 okay. no it's a conversation, wherever that, the answer yeah. to what you yeah. think was a question, whatever it. <laughs> well, I think the other thing is that uh, getting back to what Alex said is about, you know, uh, intimacy with people you know it's, I, I think it's one of the most um, stunning surprises for me is we all have family, but, uh, but how, how much do we talk to family, you know? And I have family uh, all over the country. And because of the pandemic, we see each other every week now. Mm. And before the pandemic, maybe I talked to them once a year, twice a year, you know? It's really amazing what's happened. It's actually brought my family together in a way I never expected because we can all see each other at the same time, you know, on the Zoom thing, you know. Uh, uh, so, and also I feel like because of the pandemic, it also essentialized who's important in your life. How, who are the people important in your life? And that's been very interesting to see, you know, it's, our, our our relationships have become more dear, you know, um, and that's that's been beautiful. I find, and I'm not sure if it didn't happen, I would be as aware of it, you know. And it's not just the pe the people; it's the things mm -hmm. and the ideas that are important. I um I deactivated my Twitter account, even though Twitter seems to be a very important aspect of my industry. Um, it is the thing that you do to promote yourself um, and promote your product um, and supposedly be in communication with your colleagues or your fans or your readers. Um, however, it's a major sacrifice that I felt like I needed to let go. And a word that you brought up several times, Ping, was narcissistic um, and narcissism. And I was thinking a lot about that very recently um, because I feel like it's attached to social media um, where um, there's a lot of ideas being thrown at you whenever I visit, used to visit Twitter. Um, it's everybody knows everything and you put your ideas out into the world as some sort of expert. And I'm wondering where is everybody getting the time to accumulate all that information 
um, if they're all constantly spewing it out? Where's that quiet inner time to reflect and have what young people say, downloads from the universe um, to think about the world and kind of sharpen your worldview? When is everybody doing that? And I think the pandemic was supposed to be a time that we can do that, but it seems like everybody just stepped it up a notch in terms of promoting a thing and being yeah. out there. And it felt incredibly noisy. It sounded noisy on the internet. The quieter it got outside, the louder it got on the internet. Um, and cause we we're all stuck to a screen and I've done lots of Zooms, Crowdcast, <laughs> Um, Google Meets, what have you. And once I, I'll do a talk behind the screen and you know that there's an audience there. I think my biggest audience was close to 500 people and you see the numbers there, but you don't see the faces, but it's the idea of there are 500 accounts who are logged on and registered. And then the thing is over and you're left with a blank, blank screen, you know, or your cluttered desktop. And there's something emotionally deflating about that process of just being in conversation with people and then it's over, you turn off your screen and then you go back to your somewhat empty home or dishes in the sink. And I don't know how others are doing it, how others are so loud behind the screen. Um, I don't know if it's like a, um, a coping mechanism or is it that we're already artists and we will, we will naturally gravitate inward versus the extrovert who feels like this is their job, this is their um, livelihood. What is, the, what is your process? I mean, is it something where, would you feel to step it up where you have a captive audience if you are that kind of person or are you the sort of artist who will retreat inward? I don't know why I'm asking because I think you all yeah. answered. Well, it's interesting, uh, a thing came up for me listening to you to talk about narcissism and the kind of duet, like there's a duality there that like that I think, uh, so my struggle with narcissism would be the one of turning inward and not engaging socially, where I sometimes feel like I'm narcissistic when the point where like, I become sort of self-involved and self-engaged to a point where I don't really socialize. And so that's, some, yeah, so it's, it was just brought up that duality for me where narcissism, yes, is the one of the person who wants to be seen and um, always sort of speaking. But then there's, the, you know, then there's this other narcissism that I sometimes struggle with, but with myself is the one where I'm a little bit more, um, I feel like I push away. Uh, I push away like social events or like a, a very intense social life where like I don't have a computer so people can't really I can't I usually don't do these types of things um, or just like I'm always like oh, I don't want to do that um, and so like I super retreat but then I think that's a part of the the tension of the work is that the work it's it's, it's like a very the work for me is like very social in painting others and painting the people around me but it's also very intimate where it's like, I don't try to think about them as representations of, I try to, I like, I think about them more as like uh, moments. Um, and so I'm like kind of constructing these moments um, for an, like in the image, in the painting. And so for me, like, I, I just thought that I, that was an interesting thing list, li listening to you talk about narcissism in that way. Cause I feel like I always struggle with it in the opposite way. Of but is that, is that a definition of narcissism? King, is that, is that? I don't think so. I think I think that's just balancing your your needs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think of that as narcissism. I just think it's like, uh, you know, it's like how much social life you want as opposed to how much time you need to do your work. Those are balanced life balance things. I don't, I don't see yeah. that as narcissism particularly, yeah. yeah. What, um, is your, what is your definition of a narcissistic artist in the world? I wasn't thinking of artists particularly when I talk about narcissism. I'm talking about a society that is is uh, because of our the propaganda of capitalist media. You are constantly encouraged not to go to to reflect, not to go inside your essential true self. You're always being encouraged to uh, be to uh, to go outside 
to satisfy the lowest common denominator of human experience, which is to consume, whether it's about products or whether it's about anything, you know, it's about consumption. It's a capitalist society. So what do they want? They, everything has to be about profit. Human relationships are, have to be about profit. You know, the way we treat our old people in this country, you know, I, I mean, in New York City, there was um, um, not too far from me, really, in, in an old, uh, um, old uh, immigrant Jewish neighborhood that's now a, a Chinese immigrant neighborhood, but, um, and all poor, you know, whether it was Jewish or Chinese, they were all poor and struggling and so on. And there, there's a senior senior home there, and it's just they just the, the real estate people just took it and kicked the old people out. Where are they supposed to go? You know, I don't know what's happened to those people, but I mean, this is this society is until it. Uh, I, I mean, unfortunately, because it's it's the one percent always. I mean, the history of the world is the one percent screwing everybody else. That's the history of the world. It's not any, it's not, I mean, we do live in a system that particularly encourages that, but the history of the world's always been that. Why did the immigrants come over here? Because they were in, like, I think of the Italians, for example, they were like starving peasants who um, were being, um, you know, the, 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 the lords, the, the arist aristocracy were just um, like vampires, you know? Everything that they produced, the farmers produced, had to go to the the um, the lord or whatever they call them, you know, the duke, the duke or whatever. And I mean, those people were starving. If they had meat once a year, they were lucky. You know, this we forget what immigration's about. Why do people leave? And and in this country, you talk about immigration. I mean, the 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 White House talks about immigration. Like, why would you want to leave your home? Why would you want to leave your family? Why would you want to leave your culture? Because it's bad there, where what's horrible, what, what's happening there. People don't leave because they want to. You know, they leave for a better life, for their children, for the next generation, whatever, you know. And uh, people forget that in this country, that people, I mean, if Americans had to leave this country, yeah they'll understand better what they'll empathize better what that means eb and i are both immigrants you know when i read your your um, bio i said well you know we have we understand things that a non-immigrant doesn't you know and and even in 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 the black community the uh, the southern blacks who moved up north were immigrants you know chicago is actually a very interesting uh, immigrant city and uh, for the Mexicans and and for black people and so on, you know. So it's actually an, an interesting, a different kind of immigrant uh, history, but it is an immigrant center, you know. Yeah, and I grew up in this neighborhood called Uptown. It's on the north side, um, and in that neighborhood, I forget maybe like Uptown. Or what? Um, where is where is that? It's on the north side. So it's the two, so then the. Is Halstead uptown? Halstead is just south of it. So okay. it's like uptown and then just south would be like Buena Park. But Halstead is also a street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like you're the, the main center of Halstead, like where all the businesses is, that's south of uptown. Okay. But uptown was like when I was growing up in uptown, it was uh, a neighborhood of a lot of SROs, which are like um, mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, oh, my, my brain just farted um uh halfway houses in a sense mm -hmm. um and then but there was also a lot of immigrants where like the building across the street was a a cooperative of eastern europeans and and actually the yeah the neighborhood was kind of filled with like sros and like co-ops where you had which i don't really know the specific history but i think they were like kind of constructed in like the 60s um where there was like a, a middle eastern actually co-op like a an african co-op um, of a lot of people from like Nigeria. Um, and then, so I kind of grew up like also in this really interesting neighborhood of all these different cultures and what specifically what they brought because it's still, they, they still exist. Like they, um, there's been a lot of gentrifying but because they, there were these co-ops that were constructed they sort of own 
the buildings that they live in collectively. Um, what I noticed during um, the pandemic specifically that I remember from my childhood was like um, the use of public space that I never really saw Americans use, like definitely white, specifically white Americans, um, that like during the pandemic, you see families from different cultures um, out in the park, um, uh, just like playing soccer and just sitting and talking a lot of the times, which is like that kind of informed me because I grew up in this neighborhood and I saw this, but it was something that you don't really see in other neighborhoods really, um, the kind of use of public space that, I mean, this is a tangent, but like, just like, yeah, just the different, yeah, the different, like the use of time that the immigrants I think brought into my neighborhood that I experienced not being an immigrant um, was kind of just beautiful because it wasn't, they weren't living in their like individual um, apartments in a way. It was like a collective experience that they brought um, out into the world in the park specifically. That was a tangent that made no sense. Why did I say that? <laughs> Once we get off, I'm like, why do you say that? Um, yeah. no, but it's about time. It's about I use want. of time in the pandemic and how time has changed in the pandemic as well for everybody, you know? Use of space. Use of, use of space, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of, I live, uh, so Uptown is also on the lake. And okay. So, um, so we, so I grew up like, like basically across the street from the park. And so our neighborhood just butted up against the lake in the park. So there's a weird lake park, park culture <laughs> as well um, that we have. EB, do you know Chicago at all? I've been twice. Um, have you I'm been to the Writers Museum? There's a writer's museum. In There's there. a writer's museum and it's really fun and cool. You should check it out next time you get to Chicago. Well, wow. I will. I love um I love Chicago. Um Chicago and Detroit are some interesting cities. Um they're in conversation with New York City. Um I'm thinking of like, you know, north, somewhat Midwest. <laughs> um called the music is what I have. I, I love house music. And I know that house music, um, you know, they, they went through New York City, <laughs> 80s, um, Detroit and Chicago were all in conversation through house music. So that's yeah. the only thing I know, yeah. Maybe I'd, I'd like to um, also ask uh, uh, you folks, that, that question that I posed about who determines who an American is. Um, because I think of one thing be, uh, from my culture, so maybe that'll help trigger whatever you think, which is um, when the pandemic hit and uh, the anti-Asian um, violence was happening across the country, uh, it wasn't, it was, it was, first of all, I, I think the term Asian and the term Latino and even the term black is, is, is oversimplified, you know? I mean, Asia is a huge continent with very different people and Lat, Lat, Latino is like, hello, it's a continent, you know? And, and it's, why is this constructed, this, these terms? It's a kind of xenophobia, you know, that, that, uh, has been constructed and it's completely shallow in in the way it's thought of you know I, um, I, yeah i agree with you um i'm i am black visibly but um i'm just finding out that i'm also latinx um because i'm haitian and haiti is a latin american country because it was colonized by the french and the french spanish italian and portuguese are all Latin speaking countries. So when they colonize the new world, those countries are considered Latin America. So you're absolutely right, um, Ping. I don't know if you finished your thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and blackness too. Blackness does not include Africanness, you know, yeah. Americanness and Caribbean. Um, I went to Hunter College. I, I finished out my last two semesters at Hunter College. And in Hunter College, I was minoring um, in the Black and Puerto Rican Studies Department. 
And that was an apart department, just like, you know, the biology department or the English department. And that department was called Black and Puerto Rican Studies because it was the Black and Puerto Rican Studies, um, Black and Puerto Rican students at Hunter College in the late 1960s, I believe 1969, who wanted an ethnic studies department to study their own culture and history and advocated for that department. And they called it exactly who they were at the time, which were Black and Puerto Rican. And I don't know if you remember Ping, of course you remember how there was like a Black and Puerto Rican solidarity in New York City. Um, so all of that, I'm thinking of how we define ourselves based on what we know. You know, um, those young people didn't know Africana or Latinx or Hispanic, they knew Puerto Rico and they knew blackness. And that blackness wasn't even synonymous with what we call African-American now. Um, so in that sense, like, how did you, how does your identity fit into the, the, the neighborhood that you grew up in and your city? Me specifically, Alex? Both of you. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, I'm biracial. My dad is black and he's from the South side and my mom's white. She's from the North side. So I feel like I've always internalized, um, a complicated sense of self, even though I identify as black and that's, um, Grow, I, grew up, I grew up skateboarding as well. So I was like, so I, I mean, it's also hip, like hip hop culture as well, the black culture in, in America. Like I grew up under the umbrella of hip hop, like skateboarding. I never really did graffiti, but people around me, graffiti writers and stuff like that. So I, of course, cult, like I'm not of course, but culturally I always identified as black through the lens of hip hop. Um, but that still didn't erase like a complicated relationship that I would have with myself throughout time um, in moving through spaces because like the house was, was um, diverse. So um, even though I would go out in the world and I never was experienced as white, <laughs> I still had a white mom who experienced the world as white. And mm -hmm. so how, like, so I'm, um, learning her perspectives on things, right? And so I'm going out and, and I have white friends and I have black friends and growing up skateboarding and like whatever. So it's like, um, so it for me, it was always about trying to just get to that interpersonal space of who the other was, um, a kind of empathy, but then realizing like what that, like realizing what empathy does. Empathy just, um, one thing that empathy does is that it um, complicates your sense of self to yourself because you're constantly changing who you are based on who you are in relationship with. And so I think when you're trying to negotiate that space of otherness um, within yourself and um, in living in a really kind of diverse space that I grew up in, like I'd never had to homogenize any experience. My experience has always been around otherness. Um, so I think it just really, what it does is that it creates a really complicated sense of self and a, and a yearning for belonging and a yearning for space, which I think is a big part of my practice um, outside of even just like making paintings. It's like the practice of just being a person in the world and practice being about preparation. And so it's always about understanding that not everyone is gonna um, experience the world the same way as you, because I never really had a homogenous any experience. Um, I wish we had more time. We don't. So I'm going to be brief because we're supposed to be summarizing our statements now. Um, like E.B., I grew up an immigrant here and I, I came to this country when I was four months old. Uh, my parents were um, Chinese opera uh, people. They came with a touring theater visa, which is prophetic for me because I remained in that profession. Um, and I grew up in Chinatown. I still live um, on the edge of Chinatown now. I moved back here seven, eight years ago. It was kind of startling to realize I'd moved home. Um, so I have a very, uh, I have real continuity in this city and uh, 
when I was uh, when I was a kid, I, I I went to an almost all Chinese school, public school. So there was like, if you weren't uh, Chinese, you were the odd man out. So there would be one or two white kids, and even some of those had relationships with the Chinese because back then there were some intermarriage going on too. So there wasn't very many. And for me, the experience go going from public school to junior high school to college was moving further and further away from my roots, which was very traumatizing and took me a long time to resolve um, my identity because I had to learn what the identity, what the culture is out there in order to survive in it. But then it took me a long time to return to uh, my S essential self. And at this point, there's no denying I'm a hybrid. You know, I mean, I grew up in this country, but because I'm a first generation immigrant, I also am very close to my culture. And I'm very grateful for that, that I'm still very close to that. And because of the, of the trauma of, of realizing that I was alienated from the larger culture, that has taught me empathy. That has taught me to spend a lot of my life working on creating spaces for people here who are treated as other to have a voice. That's the work that I've been doing a great deal of for the last 27 years. Ebi? Uh, well, uh, I think we can all summarize. My, I'm Haitian. And the one thing I can say is that um, Haitianness in New York City, um, just a troubling in, um, relationship. In 1990, Haitians had marched across the Brooklyn Bridge in protest um, for the CDC claiming that how people contract HIV AIDS viruses through the four H's. Right. Um, uh, being a homosexual, um, hemophiliac, heroin, and Haitian. And so yeah. that, uh, I was uh, in middle school when that happened. So that framed my understanding of Haitianness um, in the world and within the context of America and New York City. Um, so just, I just know that there are, Black people are not a monolith. Um, and immigrants um, have just a heavier burden to carry in this country as artists too. <laughs> well, it's the Chinese virus now. You're off the hook. <laughs> oh yeah, we should have <laughs> <one>, right? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how much time do we have left? I don't know. I think we're, we can wrap it up. Thank you so much, you all. This was a great conversation. Well, it was a real pleasure meeting you both. I, 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 I wish we had a little more time over coffee or something, but yes. anyway, real pleasure and good luck to all your work. Nice you to too. meet you both. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.